Melissa, welcome. Hello. You look beautiful. The kids are in school. I can have some fun. Yeah, day off. Well, thanks for spending it with us. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. I am so thrilled that you're back on stage in New York and in this gorgeous production of Finian's Rainbow at Irish Rep. This is a production, a show, rather, that you know very well. You've been performing it on and off for, what, 15 years or so? About 15 years, that's right. I first did it when I was quite young. And uh, Finian's Rainbow is a beautiful show and written by Yip Harburg and a wonderful team of people. And some of you uh, may know Wizard of Oz. And hmm. so it comes from the same, Heard of same writers. And so it has that, that world of fantasy. But what makes it so special and so beautiful is that it's not just a, a fantasy like the Wizard of Oz, but it's an overt story, a fable, that addresses issues of um, what constitutes America and the American people. And it really is, underneath all the playfulness, it's something that tries to talk about. America is a place of many races. And it's a, the, um, the writer himself that I'm talking about, his goal was to laugh racism out of existence. Wow. That was his, those are, I quote. And so it's just a beautiful show. It's fun. It's pretty. It's got all kinds of lovely qualities, which we can talk about. But underneath it, it has a beautiful message. And I yeah. think that's what's making it timely and really reassuring because people are loving the show because people know that, that it's right. Well, it really does feel current. And it's sort of, in a weird way, it's sort of like unfortunate how current it feels. I know, because it was written in 1946. And you're looking at that, I mean, just from a numerical uh, level, it's it's, that's about 10 years before Rosa Parks, you know, resisted oh. segregation on that bus. I mean, 10 years. These writers were way ahead of their time. And they, they looked at America and they thought, why is this happening? So this takes place in the Jim Crow South. So as much fun as it all is, like underneath it, there's a leprechaun who loses his pot of gold. And so he changes from green to, uh, you know, uh, Human. To, to, <laughs> to being a mortal, as he says. And then he meets the senator who was a real... Uh, uh, racist and a very bigoted and very angry person and the senator I meet him and I happen to be standing over the pot of gold so I say gosh I wish I wish you were black so that you would know what kind of life you know and as I'm standing over the pot of gold the senator changes to black and then the senator is upset that he's black and he meets the leprechaun in the woods who says well I used to be green a few weeks ago don't you find occasional change of color interesting and it's all about changing color, and we're all the same underneath. And then he says, this woman, this witch, which would be me, because, of course, women with any uh, power. strength or power would be, in those days, would be, uh, would be uh, called witches. You know, this is quite classic American uh, bad stuff. Um, and he says, you know, oh, so the witch, I see. So the witch, she made a mistake. She changed your outside when she should have changed your inside. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, this his inside wonderful. does change. His inside... Spoiler alert, sorry. Yeah, his um, inside does but, change. And, and there's a lot more insides to change, isn't there? But sure. it will happen. Um, you wrote a beautiful piece for the New York Times about playing this role again after so many years, um, centering around the idea of being an ingenue. And, uh, you know, I think... <laughs> what does that mean? I'm trying to be an ingenue. Um, Look, you would not have gotten cast as the role of Sharon in any production if you if weren't pull, able to pull it off. lighting. No, come on. <laughs> no. Can you explain what an ingenue is for, for anyone who's right. not familiar with the term? I remember out there so young. I can see you're young. If you ever heard the word ingenue, an ingenue is, a, is an expression in theater um, for the young character, mostly. Um, ingenue, I think, actually means youth, youthful. Um, if you ever heard the word, you know... Uh, ingenuous or something. It's got all the sweet and wholesome qualities of the character, usually the sweet young girl. Um, should I always look at my, your audience? I'm, so t I'm such a live theater person, or should I look at you? <laughs> Whatever you want. <laughs> We've TV got cameras all Let's over the this. place. Let's do this. I'm all around so, the world. Hi, everyone. So you can look directly to the camera. You can look at the audience. You can look at me. You can turn and look at the Empire State Building behind you. Whatever oh you want. Don't give me too many choices. <laughs> all right, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so the ingenue is the young character. And I did play this, um, this role when I was a good deal younger. I've since had three children. Um, and I am much more of a grown-up, and I was asked to do this role this year. And um, I thought, well, I, the character isn't from a real place. She's from Glockamora, which is a town that represents hope. But it's she, Irish. It's like it's, it's not Irish, a real Irish and town, it's but slightly fictional. So if I had to talk my way out of this paper bag, I could say that the character has no age. But the truth right. is that I should be 29, and I'm so not. Um, and I wrote an article, an op-ed piece in the New York Times about. 
um, I was invited to write, and I said, he said, what the, the editor at the time said, well, what's going on in your life? And it was like typical actor, you know, between jobs, you're like, nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, kill myself. You know? <laughs> and I've just been asked to play a part I'm too old for. He goes, that's funny. And I was like, it is? He said, well, what's going on in your mind? I said, well, what's going on in my mind is that as you get older as a woman in musicals and musical theater, like, how do you, wh what are the choices you make, you know, and how could I actually pull this off? And so he said, would you pack and unpack your mind, which as you see is a process, um, on paper about the decision to play an ingenue again and at this point in my life. So I did, I wrote it, and I'm, you know, I'm giving it a good, a good go every night, and it's just been such a wonderful time. Well, you're doing an going incredible so well. job at it. Like, I, it's such a, a success and such a treat, and here I am on your show. I mean, this is like, you know, Mommy's really appreciative. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're certainly, I, I, I wish that you wouldn't put yourself down regarding your age, because like. I know, I agree, I get it. So th this is a good thing, we should all oof, take a deep breath. It's hard as a woman. You know, you're, you're made to feel like there is a, a um, not that there's a, like a termination date, but that there are these chapters and you're supposed to acknowledge them. And, may, and I am acknowledging them, but we also have to realize, all of us, no matter what age we are, whether we leave our teens and we enter our 20s and we have all this anxiety, plenty of, plenty of people are concerned or creating all these markers for themselves. I'm 30, I have to have this by 30. Like, we all have to ease up about these lines and just live our lives and take care of ourselves and each other and allow life to, you know, l the river to take us, you know, and enjoy that. And so that's, a, and that is a little tricky as a female in entertainment, I have to say. <laughs> I I'm sure agreed. it's tricky for all women, but it's, it's aggravated by, you know, the this and all and having to, you know, but we do look qu quite nice today, don't we? Yes, we do. Thank you. But anyway, you know, so this is a process. And so I am not saying that, um, that I shouldn't be doing it, but I do think that it's, it's, I'm glad that I created that conversation around it. Me too. And I'm super happy that it's going so well. And I look forward to the future to playing, you know, women who are in more complicated circumstances because their lives are, you know, more in the midstream. And I'm excited about that too. Being an actress is a wonderful thing because you can, um, you're a storyteller, and if your job is to talk about life, life is that is that river. And so, um, but we're all on the same river, so it doesn't have to be just acting that I was talking about. Just I think we all have to keep living our lives and certainly not feel like, you know, we're too old for any kind of happiness. Well, the fact is, no matter how old you are, you're killing it as a mid-20s ingenue in Finian's Rainbow, and you didn't cast yourself. Somebody cast you, and they did so because you were better than every other candidate out there. So if you're gonna talk about your age, I highly encourage you to be like, yeah, I'm X years old, and yeah, I'm playing 25, bring it, you well, know? Thank you, thank you. Um, I think what really suits me in the play is not so much, um, you know, everything about the, uh, the petticoat and the exterior stuff or whatever, is the music, the mm. music of this show. I know, I know my, I tell my kids all the time that, you know, they play me their music and I, not all of it I think is going to last. And they always say, I know mom, you know, Glockamora, Glockamora. <laughs> There's the beautiful opening number that I sing called How Are Things in Glockamora. And these are some of the most beautiful songs ever written. Um, and uh, Look to the Rainbow, Old Devil Moon. I know that all the cool music that's out there sounds awesome and so on, but I encourage people to never give up on these old songs. So I love to sing them, and for that, I, every night I feel well suited. I love it. So. Oh well, your voice is perfect for these songs, and I, in fact, I would say that your voice is perfect in everything I've ever heard you sing, which is a lot. Um, and you know, there's no microphones in the theater. Really? If anyone wants to hear a musical the way it would have been done in the time where this was written, which is 1946, this is the way musicals would have been heard. If I want to be heard a little extra by the audience, I have to turn towards them like this. And if I really want you to hear me, I walk towards you. So I get closer, because there's no microphone. And if I have to blend with another voice, there's no sound man out there sweetening it and making the guy and girl sound perfect and putting a little you know, wind on it at the end. Nothing. We have to develop the notes ourselves and blend. And if I'm singing with the chorus, I have to push through so you hear me, I walk towards you. It's like Ethel Merman. She must have planted her two feet, looked front and sang, you know. So we're doing that and we're singing everything natural. So that might be worth coming if, if anyone's interested in what a musical would have felt like naturally in a room. Oh, that's thrilling to know. It is. Uh, the show is running at Irish Rep through the end of the month. 
Um, there's still some tickets available, although it's selling some. very fast. So <laughs> it keeps I highly though. recommend that uh, that everyone get your tickets immediately. Um, there's a there's an adjective or couple that come up repeatedly uh, when people describe your voice. One is lovely, <laughs> uh, and the and the other is effortless, and that's the one that keeps coming up for me when I think about your voice. But I firmly believe that effortlessness is a myth. I think that the idea of getting to the point where you sound or appear like it doesn't take any work mm. takes more work than anyone will ever know. And I would love to hear you talk a little bit about your process for training your voice. I know you had a surgery, a major surgery that required mm -hmm. um, silence for a great length of all of people, time. I was silent for 106 days. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I think just think that the illusion of effortlessness can actually uh, cause people to fear getting into a business because they're not already perfect. So I love talking oh. to really accomplished performers about some of their challenges. Oh, life is so full of, of mistakes and hurts and times we fall all the time, and I am no exception. I'm definitely someone who, every day that I sing, I sing with great gratitude. I've restored myself from an injury, um, and uh, it's, just, it's just like every day of my life I have all this gratitude, but nobody should ever think when they are looking at someone and think, oh, their life seems so easy, mm -hmm. or the voice sounds so easy. Not, you know, things are, everyone has challenges, you know, so... Um, but one of the things that I've found to be a great teacher um, is my husband is a professional tennis player, Patrick McEnroe, mm -hmm. and I have three children, and I'm watching my eldest child learn to play tennis, and she's getting quite good. And uh, the, um, the lessons that I hear, and my husband, as he's training her and teaching her, he says, don't hit the ball so hard. The, if you have a relaxed arm, the ball will go faster. Mm. Don't run to the ball. Let the ball come to you. And another thing that he said to her the other day, um, I mean, there's, just, there's, always, there's always something in tennis, but he said, you know, Victoria, don't concentrate on the ball that you missed. Don't concentrate on the ball that was a winner. Always focus on the next ball. And these are amazing little lessons that come from sports. Yeah. But, so I, I, I think, you know, I'm always philosophizing about things, and I'm always believing that we have a next ball. That sounds like the topic of your next New York Times op-ed. <laughs> <laughs> is tennis analogies in the, tennis and in the life and music? Maybe, yeah. So, in addition to a, a lengthy career on the New York stage, including, uh, I mean, the where to, where to begin, Amour and High Society. I started and, in in Les Mis. I was Cosette. That's right, and, yeah. and Anna Karenina. I mean, the, yeah, it was all the 19th century books at the time. That's yeah. right. Yeah, like what did you say? You've never shown your knees on. Yeah, I, I mean, no, I haven't shown my knees. <laughs> but you also have this incredible TV career and I feel like it's such a gift to the country because we sort of hog you here in New York and keep you on the stage but every time I see that you're going to be appearing on television I'm so delighted that everyone around the country gets to see you oh thank you I was I especially television. obsessed with billions your part on billions where I mean yeah, what a show what a show I, and what a hot character I mean she had so she was a 9-11 widow and she had you know so much potential I mean it wasn't developed you know beyond I was just a small part of this amazing series but I love I love television characters because the camera comes so close to you and if they give you a really meaty character like I had there and other times I've played guest star parts or um, series regular, it's just like, it's, it's such an honor to have uh, an art form that's so psychological and comes to you because I'm so used to so much, um, not artifice, but so much um, sort of technical things that you need in musicals, a, a voice and dancing and so on. The, uh, all you need for TV and film really is your thoughts and your feelings and you just breathe and feel the character. I love, I love working in television as well. Well, I know you also do a lot of research for this stuff. I read a blog you wrote uh, when you were filming The Nick about doing oh. studies about uh, early uh, 20th century New York. Surgery. The yeah. The whole history of medicine is so incredible. Imagine how much failure has gone. We're talking about failures and ups and downs. Imagine how much failure has gone into the the field of health? Like how many mistakes you've had to make to learn to operate on someone? Do you know my my 11-year-old uh, niece told me over Christmas, she said, fail stands for first attempt in learning. And I was like, I'll take oh, that. That's nice. Victoria has something about like fail better or something. I think is written, yeah, each time you fail, fail better. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, it's all, it's, it's really important to keep hitting the next ball. 
That's yeah, cool. yeah, but the yeah. research that you do when you go into yes. your characters, whether it's on television, like with the Nick, or um, you did the research that you did, I know, for Dracula, um, digging into the original source material for the musical, like the original text. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Bram Stoker um, and the history of vampires and monsters, and, you know, that was the greatest monster probably ever created was, mm -hmm. was Bram Stoker's, uh, you know, vampire. People, of course, believe vampires were real uh, at some point, but in general, like... There's always been this effort to like write one. No one beat Bram Stoker. That was no, so never. good. Never. Can we talk about My Fair Lady? Sure. Um, I, of course, the dialect it's is so such an important part of that. And then hearing you do the dialect in Finian's Rainbow, and I've heard you do various uh, other you know, accents. Yeah, um, something in the park with George. I actually did uh, Mar uh, Marie, the the elderly, uh, the grandmother, I really got a Charleston accent for her because she actually was from Charleston, if you look closely at James Lapine's script. Mm -hmm. And when I came out in the wheelchair with the accent to the Kennedy Center, my sister said, that's not her. My mother said, there she is, there's your sister. Because uh, you had and so much makeup said, on? That's not Melissa. No, it was the voice. And I was a 90 and I had that little Caroline yeah. accent. You know, I mean, I mean Charleston. Um, so I love accents. So how do you do that? How do you learn it? Are you going, oh, are you using ask Meryl Streep. coaches? I'm asking you. <laughs> I mean, I, don't I want, know. No, you're I brilliant best. at this. So, okay, I, I do my best is great, but like, do you study with tapes? Do you study with a coach? Are you a coach? I always find a great coach, like a Juilliard or uh, Stephen Gabus or one of the great people at Juilliard. Mm -hmm. I always, I always ask for, for, I'm a big outsourcer. I'm often uh, in everything in my life. When I feel like there's something, if I'm in a rut or if I need to learn something about, especially raising kids or how they think or even how to put them to bed, I'll call someone and say, you have any ideas on how to put your kid to bed? How do you put your kid to bed? Well, apparently you're, apparently you're supposed to give them, um, you know, well, first of all, there's a, you need a ritual. You need to give kids a routine and you need to time it so that it's not like, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> you need, they need to know all the cues. But if they start driving you up a wall, which one of mine does... <laughs> <laughs> we won't say She'll which of the three. <laughs> um, and, you know, they have to play a game. And she's invented all these different games, in, like concentration and then relation. And then will you draw on my back? And when it doesn't stop and you really need them to go to bed, I was told by a child psychologist that they need a consequence or they need... A, um, mo they need a motivator that's, and, and it can't be a motivator like you're not gonna have an iPad for a week or you're grounded for the next year of your life. Children need it right then and there. They need something to motivate them. So apparently she likes that I do her ponytail in the morning. And I say, if now is really bedtime. If you want mommy to do your ponytail in the morning, I want you to be a big girl now on this side. So she's motivated. And the next morning, if she drove me up a wall and I gave her no um, difficult, you never yell at kids. You're not supposed to get hot with kids. Mm. The next morning, if she really drove you up a wall for another 20 minutes, hour, no ponytail. And you know what? They'll go to bed the next day. Oh, wow. Yeah. But just, like, stay calm and just give them motivators, and then you tell them how awesome they are. And just keep positive. But you do need to have boundaries. I think a lot of things about modern parenting that I'm learning is that the new parents, like me, are way too, too, too nice. Mm. So kids are just, like, constantly hungry for attention and help and then they're developing anxiety because they're not learning to be self-reliant. Well, you're also the founding, uh, one of the founding members of the Bowery Babe, charity, which yeah. is all about helping new moms figure out sort of what they're doing um, in this brand new role. Yes. And you, you're a founder, you're still on the board of directors. Can That's you talk right. a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, when I um, got pregnant with my first baby, um, uh, which was a decade ago, uh, I went into uh, a prenatal yoga class and I was really large and I was very uncomfortable. Some people love being pregnant. It wasn't something I did terribly easily. I was uncomfortable and lonely and a little unsure about parenting. I didn't have, I just didn't have a plan. And I was blessed to walk into a prenatal yoga school and we were sitting on the floor and the teacher used to come around and say to all the women, when are you due? And say the due date. And if I tell, I'm not kidding, this class, you would, it, someone would say, April April 20, April 19, April 21, uh, maybe May 1st. It was like we were all giving birth within two weeks. And while we were taking that class and subsequent classes, I looked around and I realized that motherhood is a great opportunity to, to meet people from all over the place. I love meeting people. I mean, you and I should have a talk show. I just love meeting <laughs> people. I love what you do. Um, and I invited these women in New York. I invited people as we were standing out with these big bellies standing on the street after class. I say, you want to have lunch? And um, New Yorkers don't usually do that, yeah. you know? 
And that, that little group of 12 grew now as thousands of women. And it grew into a mother's group. It, at, a, at one time, it was, um, it was a Yahoo group, and then it was other things. Now it is BoweryBabes.com, and it's its own like, website. It's a nonprofit, it's right? It's before there was Facebook. Wow. So Now that is saying something. It was to connect people. And so it was a small group, and it grew, and it grew. By the end of the first year, we had 175 people, then 500 people within like a year and a half. And it just got around. The women in Manhattan wanted to get together and have play dates and meet in the park, and the dads could have coffees and stuff where they would meet each other. And then we had uh, breastfeeding you know, support, and we had the post, uh, sort of a... Uh, I'm glad I don't even remember the word, uh, postpartum depression, uh, mm -hmm. you know, workshops and things. Um, so th we, offered an, we offered a lot, and we still do. Um, but motherhood was amazing because it doesn't matter who you are, what you do, real estate, this, you're a translator, you're from this country, that country. We're all the same, and we're all sort of beginning an adult thing we don't know how to do. Yeah. And doing it together was a, was, was a great survival thing. And I think it's a great thing. They do say from the old days, it takes a village. Mm -hmm. And I made a village. Yeah, you and did. I'm so proud of that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. We're going to take some questions from the audience. Sure. Um, I'm going to steal one of them because I have gotten to know you. Um, <laughs> they don't both... even know how we met. <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing. So I was aware, I've been aware of Melissa forever as a performer that was just, I feel like you have this very kind of, this timelessness that sort of is like from another era and I just, you just, uh, this ethereal kind of quality that makes you seem kind of untouchable. And then we also have Here, this I'll relationship. Here, let's touch. touch. Uh. We also have this relationship because we go to the same gym and we work out in like rainbow leotards next to each other and we've become <laughs> girlfriends. And I feel like I have these, I know these two, it's really, it's hard for me even when I'm sitting there watching you on stage and something like, do I hear Waltz, to reconcile my amazing, silly girlfriend with this just untouchable ball of golden light on the <laughs> stage. And so my question for you is this. I'm curious about a moment in your life that you felt the most famous and a moment in your life that you felt the most sort of like normal, non-famous woman. Wow. Um, <clears throat> well, the most, I don't know, successful or something maybe. I don't know. I never or glamorous. Felt the most famous or something, but glamorous. I mean, maybe the most glamorous night was the Tony Awards. I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah, because I mean, I grew up like, you know, maybe so many people out there, you know, admiring the Tony Awards and all the people on Broadway and thinking they were, you know, the most exciting people in the world, which they are, but they seem so far away. And then one day I was there mm -hmm. and that was so exciting and I was so grateful. Um, and I uh, bought a dress in France that was pretty. And so I felt good. And I was married at that time. I've been married almost 20 years now. Wow. Um, by the way, I don't have my ring on because my character is not married. And I had a show last night. So I felt really bad <laughs> <laughs> to say that. Um, so I, I think the Tony Awards is such an exciting night. Um, uh, but of course, being in shows in general is always it's exciting. But anyway, I'll say that night for the top mm -hmm. that way. And the the least famous? I don't mean it fancy? in like a like down in the dumps kind of way. I it's just like regular yeah. every day. This morning, <laughs> <laughs> making waffles or cleaning the waffles. All right, fair I don't enough. Know, every morning doing the ponytails. I mean, I I have my head on. I you know. Oh I, I, yeah, I know. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's every remarkable. Morning, every morning, and I have a dog who needs to go to the you know for a walk. <laughs> um, uh, but giving birth, I mean, I guess would be you know like mm. having a child is very humbling. Yeah. And, very much of an eye opener that you are not, um, you know, your only task anymore. And I think that that was really good for me and really eye opening just about life. You are someone's beautiful daughter, and everyone out there is someone's beautiful child. And and I think that that's probably what you're picking up on if you think golden or something. I really feel my my hope in as as a singer and as an actress is to is to um, is to put love in the world. I know that sounds super corny, and so now I get the corny uh, I love award. It. But um, own it, dude. Do I win the corny award. Um, yeah, it's just and and motherhood's only deepened that. You know, just really want to make people feel hopeful and good. And I believe that I can help. Yeah. In some way. Oh, that's awesome. Let's take some questions. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Annie. How are you? Good. I'm so happy you're here. I've been Thank such you. a huge fan of yours for so many years. In fact, when I was a 12-year-old anti-mainstream musical theater nerd, 
Amour was one of my. Wait, wait, go. I love that. You were, hang on, this set, <laughs> so you were an anti what? A 12 year old anti mainstream musical theater nerd. Anti mainstream musical like, theater. Like, I just, I was listening to like Amour and I don't know, Great American Trailer Park Musical as opposed to like Les Mis and Rent and, you know. Oh, what? great, because I've been in both departments. <laughs> oh, great, okay. great. I love your idea. Being 12 yes. is important, though. But it is really important. It's a, it was a defining, a year. <laughs> okay, it was a, it's a defining year. It's a defining year. I love it. Okay, so, so nice I'm so you. happy all you're here. Up. Yes, all grown up. Um, How's it going? <laughs> it's, it's going. It's going. Good. Um, so, we do need to get you your own talk show, Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to be a guest. Only with you. So it'd be great. Um, so now that you've sort of broken down barriers in terms of your age and type or whatever, are there any roles that you haven't played yet that you would like to play? Oh, yes. All the good ones are coming. Are you kidding me? All the complicated people are coming. Um, you want to know who they are? Yes. Well, I'm going to answer for him. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I miss the king and I, but, but that, that's a good one. But there's Mame and there's uh, Mrs. Lovett and there's Little Night Ooh, Music. Yeah. Um, there's Lady in the Dark. There's anybody who's having a, a major crisis, like um, uh, uh, Do I Hear a Waltz, which was a musical that I did this year, which was Sondheim and Rogers. I would say pretty much anything that I could do, like Gypsy at some point. I think I'm crazy enough to do Gypsy. You know, Not that I am crazy, but I think I know what that is, and it's her turn. And I think that I could do that. It may not be everyone's first idea of a belter, but I actually have a belt in there. And uh, so all that, I hope that's a good enough answer. And there's probably the next to normals, you know, revivals, you know, in a couple years or something. I love uh, the idea of growing older, actually. And maybe that'll be my contribution to all you young people, is that I'll be older in front of you, and maybe I'll make you less afraid of it. Because it's nothing to be afraid of, and I want to take it on. But God knows it's our health that ma is what matters. So please eat good food and, and drink Listen, water. Rita Moreno was here this morning. <laughs> oh, I And know. she is 85 and just like, the, you would not talk about aging like a oh, boss. I know. She's wearing leather pants, wearing up a storm. Oh my you God. Know, just, I know. She really is an inspiration. So She knew my family actually. As my, when my parents came to Manhattan, Rita Moreno was friends with my mother. Uh, they were in the same building, so they knew each other, raised kids together down the hall. So it is such a um, small world. Yeah. No, I, I admire the people ahead of me, for sure. Do we have another question? Hey. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for your great energy today. I just want to know a little bit about, um, you know, as a theater actress and having done this show throughout your career mm. and getting to go through a rehearsal process and getting to know a character as you change and then going and showing up on a TV show and getting pages that day maybe, or maybe a couple days beforehand, or mm. we change things, and I'm working with somebody I've never worked with before, and we're just gonna have to go and do this. Mm -hmm. So does one approach inform the other for you? What are the challenges? How does that work for you? Well, I love being given the, I love uh, television, and I like, um, uh, I like the non-rehearsal, but one of the things that makes me a bit of a rascal in musicals, which you can probably talk to my colleagues about, is that I like to change things on stage. So I'm always ready, actually, for TV, too, because I, you, if, if an actor is super like exciting and interesting and does something different, walks over there instead, or suddenly mad about something, I pick right up on it. And so I'm always looking eight shows a week for something fresh. So I don't really have to deal with the fact that I'm a robot in a play or well rehearsed to the point where, you know, there's some industry talk in musical theater that the show is frozen. That's an expression in musical theater. The show's frozen today. Everyone shows frozen. I always go, mm-hmm. You know, it's not that I don't do what I'm told, but I'm, <laughs> I'm soft inside. I'm not frozen. You're, so, you're, you show up ready to play every day. I like to play. I had a teacher, and I highly re recommend this book. He was my mentor, um, and he wrote a book called How to Stop Acting. And his idea was to stay fresh, that, there, that if you're preparing in the backstage and you're like, huh, I got to be upset, I got to be upset, like you shouldn't be doing that. Like that's not, you should actually be completely just caught. There's, a, there's another state of readiness that when you're out there, something will hit you and you play with that feeling. And so it's all, you're not wound up and going to do your plan. You're actually loose enough that there is no plan and that you trust the feelings will come or what does or doesn't come will also be useful. And then it keeps going. It's kind, I know this is a bit like the it sounds a little far out, but um, but I, I think I'm pretty loose creatively, and I've worked pretty hard with this teacher uh, at 
at not being too, I, he said, research, 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 then trust your research and drop it mm-hmm. and go out there and just see what happens. He used to use a lot of curses as well. I can't say them because we're on. Yeah, like, you can. This, Go for it. We can. Mm-hmm. Well, he would. Anyway, it was always F this, <laughs> F that, you know. But he would just say, Rehe-. he, he actually said, the more time you can spend with your script till it's in your body and you know it as much as you can, even if it's the night before for TV, or in my case, 15 years with Sharon, every <laughs> night I feel something. When that Finian fades out and he's actually dying, and I sort of represent hope, and I feel this world has changed under the rainbow, and no one's racist anymore. I weep every night. I cry for something and I don't quite know what it is, but I feel that show and I never gave myself a goal to cry or to want something or to perform a certain way. I think staying loose is something that I had a wonderful teacher has helped me. I'm certainly not doing that every day. There's some days that it's, it is a bit more shaped and a little bit more like not happening. But um, that's a great book, How to Stop Acting. I think you, you'll get a whole lot more of this theory if you read him and don't listen to me. <laughs> he was so smart. Harold Guskin was his name. Kevin Klein's um, great teacher. He taught Bernadette Peters, and so many great actors were coming and going uh, from that room as I was studying with him. Oh, yeah. That's wonderful. We have yeah. time for one more. Hi. Thanks so Hello. much for being here. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, you have such a beautiful, positive light and spirit, and I'm wondering how you maintain that through like a very hard industry. Well, it's a hard world now, too, right? So let's double that. Um, and that might even be way bigger than the industry. The industry will take me when they want me and not when they don't want me. Um, I think we have to be really careful in all ways not to take everything personally. Um, so I'm not going to take everything personally when I don't get a part and when there are years where I, my agent drops me because he says you're getting older and... Uh, women your age, you know, either have to be a little bit more famous or you're done. I've been told these things. What are you going to do? You say, that's their problem, or that's how they see things, or that's, that's not nice. <laughs> um, but you do have to keep going. And I do think a lot of us take everything way too personally. I've had a lot of disappointments. Um, and I do think that my uh, concentration on the women in my mother's group, my own family, my husband, my friends. I have married a guy I met when I was five. My best friends, some of them I've known since I was four, I, all the way through high school and college. Not that I've stayed friends with everybody, but I have not um, lost connection. You know, I think we, staying connected to other people, not being too self-worrying about things. Just keep going. Have a drink with friends. Go to a sports bar. Stay light, you know. I hope that answers your question. It's, it's a really hard world, and it's hard not to take everything personally. But maybe just by admitting to you that I've had 100,000 disappointments, maybe that will help other people know that, it, you know, people up here are not uh, somehow, like, up here because everything's just going dandy all the time. I will say easy is not the path to strength. You have to fight difficult stuff to get to a point where you can really actively have joy. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I also heard a a quote once someone was saying that there's like, let's imagine, you know, we're trying to cross a river or get from here to there. You want to become an actor. You want something. And sometimes life takes you to the right and you step on one stone and then you go to the left and you step on another stone or that this thing doesn't work out. So you step back. But one, you know, so life is not always forward. One day you may find yourself on the other side. And I think right now I am in a happy place. So I may not always be this happy. I may have another thing. Everyone has stuff. So right now I'm healthy. Kids are great. But I also know that that can maybe change. Mm -hmm. And, And I trust, and this might be one thing I've learned about kids, don't teach your kids to have a perfect day. Teach your kids that they have the skills to handle when things are not perfect. That is a beautiful sentiment. I think the perfect place to land to end it. Melissa, oh. thank you so much for <laughs> being here. Cat. You're so Aww. you're so wise. Go out and there. Talented. Go get them. Don't look at me. Took it, do your no. own thing. Thank you so much thank for you. being here. I'll see you at our talk show. <laughs>